President Joe Biden landing just after 8 o'clock tonight into Phoenix Sky Harbor International Airport ahead of a less than 24 hour trip here in the valley. President Trump, he will be taking center stage around 7 o'clock tonight. I'll have you take a look at just some of the crowd. Now Obama touching on many topics tonight, including the pandemic, the economy, and also education. This is a big wake up, that cold and that whipping wind, and a little bit of ice mixed in with that wind. So it's also a facial <laughs> at the same time for you. The Yuma County officials tell us they saw about 1,000 people coming through these holes in the wall every single day. Now, we've seen about 150 to 200 people just within the last hour. We do have, I believe, a Border Patrol bus pulling up right now. I can do a little taster for you guys okay. if okay. you like. Um, but yes, um, all right. Well, usually I speak like this when I talk to my family in the UK <laughs> or any of my friends. Uh, but now I've got uh, I've got both. So you get the American, but maybe we can do the British more often. <laughs> So we are actually in the car right now, as you could probably see, just because of that tear gas outside of the Capitol. We're getting up close and personal with this, the 10 tanker air carrier. The DEA sees more than 22 million fentanyl pills in Arizona last year alone. That's about half the national total. And the main entry point was right here in Nogales by the Sinaloa cartel. Mark and Ellen, we're here at Wedge Skate Park, which is off McDowell and Miller. And just take a look here. This skate park now has just been transformed into a raging river. Yeah, he's coming down there slowly but surely, uh, almost there to the ledge. And there they go. There they go, guys. Don says because of the coronavirus, he's lost about $40,000 in wedding sales. Luckily, things are starting to pick up and fast. Aaron Marine Operation got this Black Hawk in November. They're expecting two more come the spring. Cars were backed up, just driving by, taking photos, hopping out of their car to deliver flowers, all against the fence there behind me. You could see a hashtag Boulder Strong sign that has been put up. New tonight, Yavapai County residents say they are outraged over a proposed plan to build a mine right in the middle of their neighborhood. And today, the state mine inspector held a public meeting where concerned citizens could speak out. Fox 10 Stephanie Bennett has more. There are more than 100 homes in this Cedar Heights neighborhood. It's peaceful, quiet and tranquil, but that might soon change all because of this and how residents found out a flyer on a telephone pole. So that whole hillside, we're expecting it to be gone. Vicki Neasley says these notices were the first time she and her neighbors learned that a potential aggregate mine was to be developed right in the middle of their quiet neighborhood. That was the only notice that we that we ever saw. We never got any public notice from the mine inspector office, from the owner of the property, or any of the other agencies involved in this. The aggregate mining operation is proposed by Rock Supply LLC and filed their proposal with the state mine inspector's office earlier this year. They have other permits to get, uh, to the best of my knowledge, they haven't received uh, permits through ADEQ or through MSHA or any other site. Um, so this is just usually where most people start is with the reclamation plan and they move forward from there. The plan includes removing more than 616,000 cubic yards of aggregate over a 20 year operation and it will sit on a 25 5.2 acre parcel that the company owns in the neighborhood. Danny Brummett lives the closest to it. 230 feet away from my house is the rock processing area. Dozens of Yavapai County residents speaking out Thursday at the state mine inspector's public meeting. On top of the noise and general eyesore, many residents are concerned about the mine's environmental impacts and issues it could cause to their health and flood routes. Concerned about what might be in that dust that'll blow over here. Um, how much water they might use to try to mitigate the dust, which will possibly deplete and or contaminate our wells. Two representatives from Rock Supply LLC were in attendance, but refused to talk with Fox 10 on camera. After such a big turnout, another public comment session will be held in about a month. No one would ever want to live next to a mine. So to, for us to even escape that noise and all the stuff that goes along with it, you know, I don't, I don't don't know what we'll do. For now, residents plan to hire a lawyer, and they tell me that their fight is only just beginning. In Chino Valley, Arizona, Stephanie Bennett, Fox 10 News. All new at 5, a story you will only see here on Fox 10. Phoenix police are investigating after a mother says her son, who was quadriplegic, was dumped out of a wheelchair and onto the hot ground outside of a major valley hospital. His family says he was having issues with his catheter, but claims the hospital didn't fully treat him and left him in a park where he was bitten by hundreds of ants, unable to move. Fox 10 Stephanie Bennett joins us live with the story. Steph. 
John and Christina, good evening. Yeah, to make matters worse, it was also during this brutal summer heat. It actually happened right here behind me. You can see the hospital on one side and then it's the park right across here where we're at right now. Now, according to police paperwork, there was actually a man who lives in this park. He is homeless and he claims that he witnessed the whole thing and he actually let the victim use his own phone to call his mom for help. Now, a quick warning to viewers. Some of this footage may be disturbing. See, this is my son. Why did they throw you here, Jess? Because they, they don't want to call you. They didn't want to call And so I'm supposed to pick you up here. This is how they discharged my son from the hospital. Family call him their gentle giant. Ceci Garcia holding back tears after she found her quadriplegic son, 33-year-old Jesus Gomez, laying half naked on the ground outside Valley Wise Health's Maryvale campus. So when I got to the park, I just turned on my phone and started recording. On June 14th, paramedics with the Phoenix Fire Department took Jesus to Valley Wise after he says he was having issues with his catheter. Ceci works as a caregiver to her son and to others, so she was not able to go with him in the ambulance. Like a doctor came, they looked at me, they, they wrote down my name, they wrote down all my information, they gave me a shot, and then they said, all right, come on, let's go, let's get out of here. Jesus says as he was waiting, three security guards came up asking for his name, phone number, and address. Jesus says he was in a lot of pain and felt dizzy. He also suffers from a brain injury and was unable to remember that information. That's when Jesus claims the three security guards started pushing his wheelchair out of the hospital. He pushed me all the way across the street, on the wheelchair, threw me off the wheelchair, on, on the floor, at the park. They walked away. They have that information. When the paramedics left, they said, we left everything. They should have all the information. They are supposed to call somebody else to put him on a gurney and take him back home. But they didn't do that. Ceci called 911 and the same paramedics picked him up and took him to a different hospital. I'm sorry that happened to you, ma'am, because I was the guy that was talking to you earlier. According to police paperwork obtained by Fox 10, when officers and the fire captain questioned hospital staff, they claimed, quote, Jesus refused treatment, got into a non-motorized wheelchair, and left the hospital alone. But paperwork states that the wheelchair had a safety lever on the back, which is only deactivated by the person pushing the wheelchair from behind, making the probability of Jesus operating the wheelchair alone highly unlikely, let alone the fact that he is a quadriplegic. Paperwork also shows that the wheelchair was nowhere to be seen, indicating that someone brought it back inside. I couldn't move. I, I couldn't do anything for myself. While on the ground, Jesus suffered severe swelling and blistering from ants. Paramedics took him to St. Joseph's Hospital, where he was admitted for six days and underwent surgery for his originating catheter issue. In a statement, Valley Wise tells Fox 10, quote, while we cannot discuss individual patient cases due to patient privacy rules, Valley Wise Health remains committed to providing exceptional care every patient every time. In the event an issue arises that's not in line with our mission, we take steps to improve outcomes for all patients and modify any policies or procedures to ensure safe and top quality care. He's vulnerable, very vulnerable. He, he can't fight back. Justice will prevail. Yeah, and additionally, amongst that police paperwork, it says that the fire captain, when he went in there and also gave a statement, he says, quote, he responded to several calls for service related to patients of the Valley Wise Hospital being dropped off in this general area where Jesus was located in the past. Now, of course, when Phoenix police in, uh, wrap up their investigation, they're going to then pass it along to the state attorney general's office, and they've also notified Adult Protective Services and the Arizona Department of Health as well, and the family tells us that they do plan to press charges. Guys, back to you. The Pinal County Sheriff's Office tells me the US 60 and this stretch of Interstate 10 are some of the busiest spots to intercept human smugglers. In fact, they're catching car loads every single day. So we took a little ride with them. So we are down in Casa Grande. This is one of the areas they come through, whether it's coming out of the deserts or whether it's on the I-10. Um, big trafficking corridor for us. Pinal County Sheriff Mark Lamb says drug trafficking and in particular human smuggling has become a daily occurrence. Any differences like before Title 42 and now after it? Not for us. I mean, we just have seen a steady incline over the last two years and our statistics say that a 377% increase in traffic stops 
involving human smuggling, a 461% increase in pursuits involving human smuggling. Today, the sheriff and his detectives took us out to see what a typical shift is like. Within the first two hours, we saw two pursuits and two traffic stops involving human smuggling. We usually do two or three a day, maybe up to five, it just depends. Hey, step to the right. Step to the right, keep going. In this car, a 15-year-old American driver and passenger led detectives on a high-speed pursuit, eventually pulling over and revealing three undocumented migrants from Mexico in the back seat. The cartels are making so much money off of humans. And that is a big, it's a good distraction for them, for them to get their drug loads through as well. Sheriff Lamb says they're seeing a lot of Arizona drivers being recruited by the cartels to help with transportation. Like in our next traffic stop of the day, the American driver and passenger switching seats before pulling over. Turns out they had three migrants in their back seat. Sheriff Lamb says the Americans admitted to picking them up at a truck stop. And the three asylum seekers say they paid eight grand each to the cartels for a safe entry to the U.S. Since this was a federal crime, detectives wait for Border Patrol to take over. I think Pinal County logistically is one of the most important counties in America. So when you talk about fentanyl or when you talk about the humans that are being trafficked potentially into the sex trade or uh, enslaved, extorted, we become that last line of defense to be able to stop them before they get into Phoenix and, and into the rest of the country. Sheriff Lamb says it's not just people and drugs coming north into the U.S. They're also intercepting cash and weapons heading back south to the cartels, keeping their anti-smuggling unit extremely busy every day. I think this is the greatest or threat to our national security that we have right now. The problem is progressively getting worse, and I don't see any movement in the policies to change that. Congress, Senate, Congress, they all need to do better at coming up with some, some common sense, comprehensive uh, immigration reform to deal with it. For Fox 10 News, I'm Stephanie Bennett. Fox 10 Stephanie Bennett joins us live with that story, Steph. John and Christina, it was an absolute honor to witness this today and meet everybody involved on the Arizona flower market. They always try to donate their leftover flowers after Valentine's Day to somebody in need. And this time, the organizations that they chose hit a little closer to home. Buds, blooms and bountiful bouquets, florists at the Arizona flower market work hard year round to make sure your special moments are celebrated. And when they have a surplus of supply, they like to give back. In the past, we've done um, some donations to St. Vincent de Paul, Phoenix Dream Center, um, and then today we chose St. Joseph's Hospital. And the reason we chose St. Joseph's Hospital today was because our dear brother, um, Officer Ben Denham, passed away a week ago from um, some autoimmune diseases that he had been battling. The staff at St. Joseph's Hospital helped care for Cheryl's brother-in-law, Phoenix Police Officer Ben Denham. She says the medical team was in instrumental in saving his life in 2016 so they could have more time with him. Today, Ben's brother, father, nephew and wife, Debbie of 27 years, were all in attendance to hand out flowers. No matter who it is and what it is, he's there and that's why I came here. I'm like, I, my husband would want me to be here and I came. You know, because I wanted to, but I also know he wanted me to, too. This is, this is just a small little token of how much our family just truly loves and appreciates everything that everyone did here for him and for our family. For registered nurse Devin Wengraff. I actually took care of um, Ben on the last day that he was alive, uh, so it was, it was really tough. Dealing with critical cases in the ICU and losing a patient takes its toll. Today was all about spreading love, kindness, and sharing memories of the person who brought them together. Families become part of our families, and um, I think you take home a lot of those stresses, and um, you take on kind of what they're going through, and it's, it's a lot to handle sometimes, um, but just... You know, getting to do these things afterwards and stuff just really brings peace, peace to everything, I think. For now, a GoFundMe has been set up for Ben's family. We'll have a link to that on our website. Unfortunately, the Phoenix Police Department lost another officer this week, so the flower shop is also donating flowers to that precinct. Reporting live tonight, Steffi Bennett, Fox 10 News. See right here, um, once we hit this road right here, you'll actually probably see them. 
Alejandro Alverde has been a Border Patrol agent in Texas, New Mexico, and now Nogales, Arizona, for the last 14 years. And lately, he's noticed a change. It's always been busy here, uh, but what is unusual is all the people that are just coming in to turn themselves in. It's something that we're not you know, used to. It's not, it didn't ever used to happen. Alverde says in Mariposa Canyon, anywhere from 100 to 200 people illegally cross through these gaps in the border wall every single day. We came across this group of six wanting to seek asylum. Ten four, we're right here in green on the road just to the, uh, the east. Agents say spotters, usually teenagers, sit on the mountains in Mexico, watching the agents in Arizona's every move, waiting for the right opportunity to send people across. It's very busy. Um, we do have certain spots that get hit the most, um, but basically a normal agent would just go out to the field and get a, an assigned area. A lot of the people, if you go out further west and they do a, like drags on the dirt roads, that pretty much allows them to know like if somebody crossed right there, um, it, if, if it was a fresh drag, then they'll be able to actually see that, you know, somebody crossed and it's pretty fresh. He says many want to turn themselves in as they're seeking asylum, running away from violence in their home countries. They're called the give up groups, but the other half, he says, want to evade capture. The give up groups, we, we are seeing uh, people as young as just infants, uh, one year olds, uh, with usually the people that are not trying to claim asylum. It's usually from 15 all the way up to you know, 60 year olds. Title 42 was created by the CDC during the pandemic to help stop the spread of COVID-19, while also allowing Border Patrol agents to expel migrants who crossed into the U.S. What it uh, uh, allowed us to do, for the most part, if somebody came in without a visa, uh, they were returned to, uh, to Mexico. Uh, when Title 42 lists, and that was irregardless. Now, uh, some were still allowed in, you know, um, unaccompanied uh, uh, children, for example, uh, high risk uh, for abuse in another country. The Biden administration will lift Title 42 on May 11th, which is praised by some but feared by others. Many politicians and law enforcement agencies across the southwest border saying they need some sort of replacement to help combat the flow of people illegally crossing the border, as things are expected to get much worse once it's gone. The Biden administration announcing earlier this month that they plan to send 1,500 troops to help in these already busy communities. So we have to balance all our resources. Um, you know, we're confident in our ability to do that. But at some point, if we have issues with post-flight Title 42, you know, that might start affecting wait times and the number of vehicle lanes open to be able to process people or travelers coming into the U.S. Over at the ports of entry, U.S. Customs and Border Protection officers enforce over 400 laws and 40 different federal agencies, not only stopping illegal activity at the border, but also ensuring produce and other products in the supply chain are crossing in a safe and timely manner, which means they're checking every train and every semi-truck on top of their other duties fighting crime. I believe yesterday we got close to 1,800 semi-tractor trailers uh, uh, come in through here. Uh, last month, we were bringing in about 27 million pounds of produce a day. Out of all the ports of entry across Arizona, including those at airports and land crossings like these, the ones in Nogales are the busiest. Somewhere up around 30,000 a day. Officers are not only using old school methods like mirrors and canines, but new technologies like these scanners to x-ray vehicles to help keep everything flowing. A lot of this, you know, it isn't open the trunk and they're, oh, fentanyl. It's, you know, deep concealment in voids and, and kind of cars, uh, in all kinds of cars, in trains and semi-tractor trucks, on bodies and inside of bodies. And in the drive shaft doors, uh, airbag compartment, uh, air filter compartment, bumpers, floors, roofs, uh, you name it, tires, uh, gas tanks. The DEA sees more than 22 million fentanyl pills in Arizona last year alone. That's about half the national total, and the main entry point was right here in Nogales by the Sinaloa cartel. We lead the agency right now as far as uh, seizures of fentanyl pills. We've exceeded uh, well over 28 million uh, fentanyl pills approximated uh, here at the port of Nogales. 
28 million fentanyl pills. In the last six months alone, a Nogales port director, Michael Humphrey, says that's more pills than the last five years combined total. Five, six years ago, fentanyl, uh, you know, what is that, you know? Uh, and, and we got small, small amounts. It's grown incrementally every year, you know, until you, this year it's just through the roof. This is, uh, it's almost a daily occurrence. Officers say, unfortunately, fentanyl is easy to make, transport, and sell for a good profit. As demand grows, addiction is skyrocketing. To help tackle the growing workload, they're offering up to $20,000 in bonuses for new agents. Not only is it their job to secure everything coming into the U.S., but also leaving the country. We're seizing uh, high-powered rifles, assault rifles. Uh, the other day, we got uh, 19,000 rounds of AK-47 assault rifle ammunition going into Mexico. For now, it's a waiting game to see what comes after Title 42 ends. But these guys say they'll be ready. It's a very rewarding field, even though right now it's kind of complicated. Um, you know, at the end of the day, it's very rewarding. You know, security for your family, 